like I said, I have many more, but I, um, more than 30 years ago, I joined Ronald Reagan at the White House um, ceremony uh, when he raised the issue of the Baha'i in Iran. And it was a very momentous occasion, um, and he really helped bring focus for the first time, at least um, in this country, uh, on the persecution of the Baha'i by Iran. And we know Iran does violate, uh, you talked about equal opportunity uh, in China, well, they, they, they violate the religious freedom of a whole lot of people, including Pastor Abedini. And um, if you might want to spend a moment, we do have um, a representative of the Baha'i, um, uh, Kenneth Bowers, uh, who will be testifying. Uh, with very strong insights as to how discriminated against and persecuted the Baha'i actually are uh, in Iran. It, but if you would want to take a moment to just... The persecution of Baha'is around the world now is an atrocity of the very first rank. Uh, I fear, Chairman Smith, that the Baha'is are becoming the Jews of today. My great friend, Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of England, points out that throughout much of history, wherever there have been Jews, Jews have been persecuted. And now I fear we're seeing wherever there are Baha'is, Baha'is are persecuted. Thank God, not in our own country, but in so many places uh, around the world. And there is a sad and tragic irony here, because the Baha'i faith is a faith that includes centrally the beautiful teaching of the common brotherhood of all men. It's a beautiful teaching and that a faith that makes that so central would be persecuted almost everywhere is, is a nightmare. But here we see it. Uh, and it's time for all of us, those of us in the human rights advocacy world, those of you in Congress, those in the administration, to take note of what is happening to members of this peaceful faith who who do no one any harm, who seek nothing but brotherhood, and yet they are brutally, in many places, uh, persecuted. So we need to elevate and make more visible this fact so that, to the extent possible, we can become agents for the amelioration and relief of that uh, persecution. So this is a very high priority for me, personally. I know it's a high priority for our uh, commission. Dr. George, thank you, sir, very much for your incisive testimony. Um, it will help inform our committee and hopefully by extension to Congress. Uh, we will look very carefully at all your recommendations that you've made, and I hope that we can uh, look to move on them expeditiously. And um, thank you again. Appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Congressman Smith. I'd like to now uh, invite our second panel to the witness table, uh, beginning first with uh, Mr. Kenneth Bowers. Uh, who is the Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of Baha'i of the United States, which is an annually elected governing body representing the Baha'i in the United States. Prior to his position, Mr. Bowers owned and operated a shipping business in Atlanta, Georgia. He's also author of an introductory book on the Baha'i faith entitled, God Speaks Again. Uh, we'll then hear from Mr. Ahmede Khan, uh, who is the National Director of Public Affairs for the Ahmadi Muslim Community in the United States of America. Concurrently, Mr. Khan is a lawyer in the Akin Gump Strauss Hauer Feld, uh, a postgraduate research fellow at Harvard Law School and the president of the Ahmadi uh, Muslim Lawyers Association of the United States. Additionally, he has dedicated many hours in legal aid in representing refugees and asylum seekers, especially those fleeing religious persecution abroad. Mr. Khan has frequently lectured and published articles on issues of religious freedom in the Islamic world, particularly focusing on international human rights policy. We will then hear from uh, Mr. Bob Fu, who is founder and the president of China Aid Association, a nonprofit organization that advocates for the underground church in China, political dissidents, and activists who seek to defend them. A former dissident and pastor uh, of an underground church, Mr. Fu, Pastor Fu and his wife came to the United States in 1997 as religious refugees. Uh, he also spent some time in prison as a political prisoner. He is now a professor of religion and public policy at Midwest University. Additionally, uh, Pastor Fu is editor-in-chief of the Chinese Law and Religious Monitor, and I would note parenthetically has been of tremendous aid on a number of individual dissidents that this committee and this chairman has worked 
uh, tirelessly to try to effectuate, effectuate the release of. Uh, most notably, I would have to say, would be Chen Quan Jin. Bob played the most pivotal role, I think, in the world in bringing that blind activist um, lawyer to freedom. So I want to thank him publicly for that again. I'd like to now, Mr. Bowers, if you could begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify on the topic of religious freedom, which is truly one of the most vital and pressing human rights issues of our time. And I would like to request that my written statement be included in the record. Thank you, sir. I am the secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, which is the elected governing body of the Baha'is of this country. The Baha'i faith is an independent world religion with some 5 million followers in over 200 countries and territories, representing virtually every racial, ethnic, and national group on the planet. The Baha'i community is the largest non-Muslim religious minority in Iran, with over 300,000 members. Since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, religious minorities, including Christians, Zoroastrians, Jews, Baha'is, and Sunni and Sufi Muslims have been subjected to persecution by this government. For Baha'is, the persecution has been both severe and systematic. It is official government policy to deal with Baha'is, and I quote from one of their own documents, in such a way that their progress and development are blocked, end quote. Unlike other religious minorities, Baha'is are not recognized under the Iranian constitution. Their blood, therefore, is considered mobah, which is a term which means that it can be spilled with impunity. Over 200 Baha'is have been executed and thousands more have been imprisoned, many of them tortured. They are arbitrarily arrested and detained, their homes are raided, and their property is taken without compensation. They are denied jobs and excluded from the nation's university system, and they are surveilled and required to register with the government. Their marriages are not recognized. They cannot inherit the property of their deceased relatives. Their holy places have been destroyed, and their cemeteries are desecrated. May 14, 2014, marked the sixth anniversary of the imprisonment of the seven former members of the ad hoc leadership group of the Baha'is of Iran, who were sentenced to 20-year terms for their efforts to minister to the basic needs of the Baha'i community. There are also 12 Baha'i educators in prison for their efforts to educate Baha'i youth who are denied entrance into Iran's universities because of their religion. With the election of Hassan Rouhani, a self-described moderate to the presidency of Iran in June of 2013, the Baha'i community held out some hope for an improvement, however modest, in the situation in Iran. But since his inauguration on August 4th, the situation for the Baha'is has uh, rather deteriorated. On August 4th, uh, 24th, 2013, a prominent Baha'i in Bandar Abbas was killed in what was by all indications religiously motivated. Uh, and in February of this year, a Baha'i family in Birjand, Iran, was stabbed by a masked intruder who broke into their home, though they fortunately survived. There has been no progress in the investigation of either of these cases. Two Baha'i cemeteries have been attacked in recent months. One in Sanandaj in December 2013, which was partially destroyed, and one in Shiraz, which is currently being excavated. In November 2013, President Rouhani issued a draft charter of citizens' rights, a document that does not expand or strengthen the rights of Iranians, but instead appears to further entrench existing discrimination, including against Baha'is. In January 2014, the number of Baha'is in prison in Iran reached 136, a two-decade high. In short, the situation for the Baha'is of Iran has worsened rather than improved since President Rouhani took office. But in spite of all of this, there is a ray of hope. With the rise of the internet, Iranians are increasingly able to access information from sources not controlled by the state. This, combined with the gross mistreatment of citizens of all backgrounds, has undermined the government's attempts to justify its persecution of minorities and others, and has fueled a burgeoning human rights discourse in that country. 
And in the last several years, numerous prominent Iranians have spoken out for the rights of the Baha'is, often at great risk to themselves, further contributing to growing support for the Baha'i community among Iranians. Just last month, an extraordinary development took place when a senior cleric, Ayatollah Abdulhamid Mas'umi Tehrani, gifted to the Baha'is of Iran a calligraphic work of verses from Baha'i sacred scripture. Earlier this month, he participated in a meeting at which a number of human rights activists, including the recently released lawyer, Ms. Nasreen Sotudeh, called for an end to discrimination against the Baha'is and signed a photo of the seven imprisoned Baha'i leaders. And Mr. Chairman, if I may just show this photograph. This is a photograph of these people together, and you may not see it from here, but this is uh, an ayatollah, a very high-ranking Islamic cleric who has spoken on behalf of the rights of the Baha'is. And also in this picture, and I won't bother pointing them out, but just so that you'll know, uh, are Mohammad Nurizad, who is a journalist and uh, a former supporter of the regime, but now is a reformist. Uh, Dr. Mohammad Maliki, the former president of the University of Tehran, who publicly has apologized to uh, the Baha'is uh, last year. Narges Mohammadi, a prominent women's rights activist uh, who spent time in prison with some of the Baha'is. Nasreen Sotudeh, a human rights lawyer whom I mentioned. Masume Dehgan, an activist and who is also the wife of a prominent human rights lawyer who is now imprisoned for his representation of the Baha'is. And then finally, Jila, uh, Bani Yaqub, and Isa Saharqiz, who are two prominent journalists who have also spent time in prison. So this is an extraordinary photograph of an occasion where these people together have really gone out uh, and taken a great risk on behalf of the rights of the Baha'is. And I thought that the subcommittee should see this. So we can see that we're now at a critical juncture because it is important to continue shining a spotlight on human rights and religious freedom in Iran. The government of Iran is, despite its protestations to the contrary, very sensitive to international opinion. And so we believe that this spotlighting has prevented the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran from becoming much worse than it already is. And mounting international attention lends crucial support to the domestic movement for human rights within Iran. Critical to these efforts are the State Department's International Religious Freedom Reports, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom's annual reports, public statements made by State Department officials and USERF commissioners, and op-ed pieces in major news outlets authored by USERF commissioners, including, uh, we would add, an op-ed on the persecution of the Baha'is of Iran published only this week in the Wall Street Journal's Opinion Europe section. These put the Iranian government on notice that it is being watched, provide other governments and civil society actors with the information they need to continue their work and serve to highlight issues of human rights and religious freedom. We are hopeful that these rights and freedoms will be an important part of the U.S.'s current dialogue with Iran. The U.S. Congress has also consistently condemned the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran. House Resolution 109, now pending in the House with 113 co-sponsors, yourself among them, sir, condemns this persecution and urges the President and Secretary of State to utilize all available authorities to impose sanctions on Iranian government officials and other individuals who are directly responsible for serious human rights abuses, including against the Baha'i community. Resolutions like these constitute a strong statement from the U.S. government to the government of Iran and to friends and allies around the world, help garner media coverage, raise public awareness of the situation in Iran, and support accountability for human rights violations in Iran. We hope that those representatives who have not yet co-sponsored House Resolution 109 will do so and that this resolution will be passed with strong bipartisan support. I thank you again. Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing and for inviting me to offer my testimony. And we do hope that hearings like this will continue to shed a light on religious freedoms violation in Iran and will help to hasten the day when Baha'is and all the people of Iran are accorded their full human rights. Ferris, thank you so very much for your testimony. And uh, I'll wait for questions until everybody's done. Uh, well, I, I don't deal directly with the United Nations myself, so I can only give a wish that the United Nations could be more effective in many different ways. But uh, also, though, to give credit, 
it does seem as though that uh, the work of the United Nations has been effective, I think, in mitigating the severity of what is going on with respect to the Baha'is in Iran. And one can partly tell that by the, um, the, the violent reactions of Iranian authorities every time there's a vote, you know, in the UN uh, condemning their activities and so on. So one can see, and of course, their, uh, their uh, very aggressive fight not to have a UN spe special rapporteur to be appointed and so on to go to Iran. So one can see that they're very sensitive to even the fact of the discussion and these, these statements uh, and vote. Uh, from what I understand, the work at the UN also has paved the way for discussions in countries that have been slower to respond to the, uh, the um, or to lend their voices, I should say, to the persecution of religious minorities and others inside of Iran.